Kia ora, my name is Armagan Sabetian and I am the group leader for Aotearoa Scleroecolnology. Today we are travelling to Otata Island in the Hauraki Gulf with some of the key people involved in our latest publication on shifting baselines of snapper habitats. Uh, my people of Ngaitai Kitamaki have ancient connections to this motu of Otata. The midden that we're standing in front of reflects a time period both before and after the eruption of Rangitoto in about um, the years 1300 to 1400. Underneath those layers of uh, tephra and ash are the cultural layers of my people. This was an area that was very important to us, including all the surrounding motere, the islands that we occupied both seasonally uh, for different purposes and throughout the year. We grew different crops on different islands, but this island of Otata was one where we came to catch our ika, our fish. We would split them and dry them in a process called pāwhara for winter use. We concentrated mainly on the tamure, the snapper, but also the mango, the shark, and every other species that came along and got caught in our nets. Nothing was wasted. So this place was essentially a summer camp, and here we would spend periods long enough to dry and preserve the fish. So we occupied this place over many generations, back to the 1300s and earlier, into time immemorial. But alongside of that is the oral histories kept by my people that captured the names of all of the people living here from time immemorial down to now. The relationships to the place, the relationships to the activities are uh, fundamental in our understandings and in the histories passed down to us orally. We as the living embodiment of our history have become the modern caretakers and guardians in this age. Oh, kia ora koutou. my name is Matthew Campbell, I was one of the archaeologists on the excavation here and I'm the one that's been uh, supervising the uh, fishbone analysis from the midden and you can see the middens behind us which are these layers of shell, a midden is um, food waste essentially so people were coming out here to the small island from, from the mainland uh, and they were gathering the local shellfish and eating it, and especially they were fishing. They were mostly fishing for snapper, which is a, a species of sea bream. And they were fishing for them, they were taking their heads off here and taking the bodies back to uh, the mainland, probably as a winter food. And uh, we see that there's mostly head bones here and very few vertebrae. So mostly they were coming out for snapper. Snapper make up to 80% of some of the fish bone that's found in the middens. At the bottom, is occupation one, which dates to around about uh, 1350 to 1400 or so. And that's the earliest occupation we have here. Above that, we have a layer of uh, volcanic tephra. When Rangitoto erupted, one of its final eruptions throughout a lot of tephra that sort of smothered this part of the uh, Hauraki Gulf. This excavation square here, there was a very small occupation too. Occupation three, you can see all these 
These stones are all used for cooking. Then we have occupations four and five. My name is Emma Ash and I'm the Associate Curator at Auckland Museum and I'm one of the co-leads on the Ōtata Archaeological Project along with Louise Fury who is the ex-curator at Auckland Museum. The catalyst for the excavations was a massive storm in 2018 which eroded several metres from the coastline and caused significant damage to the midden along the beach here. The first excavation was conducted in 2020 and it was in partnership with the Noreta family who are the custodians of the Noises and Naitaiki Tamaki who are mana whenua. Um, so this project aimed to kind of weave together the archaeological data and also Matoronga Māori. In 2020 and 2021, five square metres were excavated um, and that created for about 500 bags of midden material which was then taken back to Auckland Museum for further sorting and analysis. During analysis we have identified a diverse range of both fish species and bird species, many of which are no longer seen in the Hauraki Gulf now or birds that no longer breed on Otata Island. These kind of middens are really important as they contain a huge amount of bone and shell material which can tell us what both what people were eating at the time, how people used to live, what resources were available to them, but they also give us a really interesting picture of what the environment was like at the time and how this has changed over time. So Auckland Museum houses a number of these midden collections and they're really important legacy collections as they contain that wealth of environmental information. I'm a big advocate of how archaeology can contribute to contemporary issues such as climate change and ecological restoration. It's important that we care for these collections that have all this amazing environmental and cultural information embedded in them um, so that they are available for the future as well as like ideas change or um, as new research projects come to light. I'm Julian Lilkendai. I'm a visiting research fellow with the Auckland University of Technology. I'm also a researcher at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research in Bremen, Germany. Today we're here in Otata, where we sampled fish otoliths from archaeological shell middens. Otoliths are small ear bones in the fish's inner ear, which we um, analyzed using a laser ablation, a process where we have a laser shooting out material from the calcified structure of the fish's otolith. Now, these otoliths are um, treasure, actually, because they give us a glimpse into the palo ecology of the Hauraki Gulf and um, the coastline of New Zealand. Now, how so? We are able to reconstruct the environment of the Hauraki Gulf by how the fish are moving. So, if fish move into estuaries, so low saline environments, um, their barium concentration go up. If they then move out again from these estuaries, their strontium concentration goes up in marine environments. Now, what we do see is back in the day, um, with the help of these archaeological finds fished by Maori, um, we can see that um, snapper were able to go through their entire ontology basically undisturbed. They spawned in front of estuaries, the larvae moved in to estuary systems where um, the juveniles would grow up. We call these nurseries. Then, after a year or so, they were moving out to the ocean again where they got proper and fed. Now, modern day snapper, they don't go through this life cycle anymore, which is highly problematic. What we do see is a decline in snapper populations over the last 50 or so years. 
but we do have the impression that the Auraki Gulf is um, revitalizing. However, we do see now that none of the fish are surviving that are moving into estuarine system or snapper have adapted to not use these estuarine system anymore. What happened? Estuaries became very turbid throughout the last 100 years because of um, Sweden agriculture, um, land development and um, the removal of um, vegetation. Also, we have pollution because of expanding cities and um, the industrialized fisheries also plays a pivotal role in this. We now hypothesize that if we are able to reconstruct paleoecological behavior of snapper through the restoration of critical nursery habitats, uh, we can make sure that these habitats will be put into a state again we find um, back during Maori days, back in the days before the Industrial Revolution. So, what does this give us? It gives us a behavioral baseline. A baseline we now try to re-establish in our modern day, or we should try to re-establish in our modern day restoration efforts. It's truly a privilege to work with our Western scientists and archaeologists to have the evidential taonga, the treasures of this evidence in the archaeology that underpins our oral history and matches our oral history. And so we see the two streams of knowledge coming together, the indigenous knowledge and Western science blending together to create a holistic body of knowledge that can work together to grow our understanding of how to approach the future, of how to look at how we best preserve what we have and enhance it for the benefit of our grandchildren and their future grandchildren so that our world maintains a livable, flourishing space for future generations.